We live in a society where woman's worth is determined by her sex appeal. We look for the definition of what is my worth, fishy for compliments, likes, and DMs on Facebook and Twitter. We're looking for love, playing your best cards, bringing your best poker face. Now I don't condone gambling, but, but this is how we treat our hearts and our souls as if we're just another card game. Perhaps you're one of those people who have played all the wrong cards in your life. Queen of Hearts. Maybe you've played this card. You're willing to lay it all down for a one night stand. But girl, don't you see that you're worth so much more than one night? I mean, I mean you're sitting at this table willing to play your cards at a chance to find love in its deepest forms, but it's crazy. It's crazy because you never see how shallow the depth is. I mean, it's sanity, right? When temptation raises the stakes, you're willing to lay down one card, one after the other, after the other, after the other, until your hand is empty. The definition of love has changed so much. It's a mix between self-satisfaction, a rush of emotions, uncontrollable lust, rendezvous, people looking for cues from Fifty Shades of Grey, Bonnie and Clyde, or the next big socialite. But let me tell you, let me tell you about this card that's been played for me. This card that trumps every card that you will ever have, that you can ever offer any given day or night. There's been doubt over and over and over again. Let me tell you because I came, I came to a standstill where I refused to play this game anymore because I was left bruised, broken, lost, spat on, violated, rejected and scarred beyond recognition as if a scalp would have been taken to me. And in my own prison I was shooting kites asking God what am I worth? This encounter with the God who molded and shaped this perfectly imperfect being that I am and it shook, it shook my soul as everything came to a screaming halt as my eyes met the cross. A love that opened up the heavens and caused the Alpha and Omega to come as man in the flesh, not Photoshop, but man in the flesh. The most resounding cry of God's love for us can be explained in one verse, John 3:16, that for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. His son whose hands that offer us unfailing love were pierced with nails driven through them. That when every hand I lay close to my heart violated me, his hands reached out. His hands reached out to me and touched the most inner hidden chambers of my heart. Even when I couldn't love myself, he loved me. And with his lips, they were so ready to breathe life upon me. As I came to the realization that Jesus hung on the cross for me, he hung on the cross for me. He wasn't looking at the cards in my hands or the one that I really played. He was looking at the person behind those cards. He was looking at me and he wanted all of me. As I struggled with the ravaging of myself in the depth of my recession, in my despair, there was a war raging inside of me to come to terms that before a righteous God, that Jesus hung on the cross for me and it's so undeserved. The transaction made to purchase my salvation and bring me to reconciliation, I couldn't comprehend why. Why would Jesus do that for me? That he not only took the weight of my sin, but he took the weight of, of humanity's sin and he paid the price. And I stood there in the presence of his greatness and I had nothing to offer because my righteousness is like filthy rags to him. My soul cried out in a desperate cry, Elohim, wash me clean. As this exchange of death and life happened and these broken bones have been revived as I laid my burdens at the feet of the cross, I came to the realization that the offer of life, Abba, Father, orchestrated this love story the story of his unfailing the epitome of undeserving love no longer will I be blinded or fooled nor entertained by this counterfeit versions of love this world offers but I know I know now because he Jehovah unveiled my understanding I know what I'm worth that even when I thought I was worthless the cross the cross says I'm worth it and it's undeserved. When I was seven years old, uh, my parents got divorced. And when my dad left, uh, it's one of those occasions that I can remember like it was just yesterday. You know, he was packing the car, he was putting in his clothes, putting in uh, the box of some of his possessions, he put in his guitar and he came up to me, he put his hand on my shoulder just like this and he said goodbye. Got in his car and he began to drive down the street. And you know, as I sat there watching the car just 
get further and further down the road, I, I thought to myself, you know, just as a young seven-year-old kid, I just thought, this was not a temporal goodbye. That was a permanent goodbye. And you know, in that moment, I, panic just began to rise up within me. I didn't want my dad to leave. I, I didn't want him to go. I wanted him to stay. And so I, I just took off after the car. I, I, I sprinted after my dad in the car and I just thought to myself, if I can catch him and I can just maybe bang on the window and I can just plead with him and tell him how much I want to stay, maybe I can change his mind and maybe he'll stay. But I didn't get there. He took off around the corner. The car disappeared out of sight. And I, I just remember crumbling to the ground in the gutter and just crying. And you know, it wasn't his intention, but in that moment, I really felt abandoned. You know, I, I felt let down. I felt alone. You know, shortly after this, my mum, she remarried uh, another guy and we moved really far away out into the country. And this guy he, that she married, he became my stepdad, obviously. He was not a good role model, you know. He was a drug addict, he was an alcoholic. And for the seven year period that I lived with him, he never worked a day in his life. And I can just remember countless times that in his drunken fits, he would just become incredibly abusive, you know, be it either physically or emotionally. And I can just recall occasions where he would just lose the plot. And in hindsight, looking back, I can see his mind truly was tormented. I can think of just numerous times in between the ages of 10 to 12 years old that I would walk into the back room or into the back shed and he was trying to take his life. You know, my sister and I, uh, playing uh, around behind the shed, we could hear someone struggling to breathe and we went into the shed and we looked up to the rafters and he was hanging from his neck as he tried to take his life. You know, I remember on my mum's birthday, you know, as he often did, he would try to take the attention off whoever uh, was having the special occasion and uh, he began to stab himself. I remember coming home from school and uh, the car was filled with fumes uh, as he hooked the vacuum to the exhaust pipe and pumped the car filled with gases, again, trying to take his life. You know, he was always abusive, but it, it seemed that on special occasions, he just took it to that next level. Christmas, Easter, or birthday, whatever it was. And I remember this one Christmas, he lost the plot. Uh, he began to beat my mum smash glasses, smash plates over her as she cowered on the ground. And I remember my mom grabbing my sister and I and we literally were fleeing for our lives. We got in the car and we went to a women's shelter, a refuge for those who were suffering from domestic violence. And we spent three weeks there, including Christmas that year. And it was just an awkward, difficult, unnatural feeling for me to experience and endure as a young boy. But it seemed like this was just the constant grind that we couldn't escape. You know, it was just a repetitious cycle where we were living in this home of abuse where there was fear and there was intimidation. And we would, just for a season, break free from that and go and live with a friend or you know, live in the women's shelter. And it felt like in that season that there was hope only to have to go back and endure it again for another round. You know, every boy, they grow up, they want to take cues from their dad, they want to learn how to be a man, uh, they want to have a father that they can reference from, and for me, I didn't get that from my stepdad. And so I started taking my cues on how to be a man from the world. You know, I idolized musicians, uh, Eminem, 50 Cent, Bone Thugs and Harmony, Tupac, you know, these people became the people that I referenced from. Uh, I started speaking like them, acting like them, dressing like them. Uh, and I thought that aggression, pride, greed, anger, you know, these things were just normal traits of being a man. And so I adopted them as part of my character and part of my makeup. And very quickly, you know, I began to spiral downhill. I got very rebellious. Uh, I, be I hated authority. And I hated people telling me what to do. Coaches, school teachers, police, whoever it was. I didn't want to be put in a box and I didn't want to be controlled. Ultimately, I wanted control. And I would do whatever it took to get control. Lie, manipulate, deceive. I wanted to be on top. 
And you know, as I continued traveling down that path, I only further uh, traveled down a slippery slope of rebellion and anger and bitterness. And this really was directed towards my stepfather. And I remember one occasion that really tipped me over the edge. I was 14 years old, I was trying to go to bed and I could hear my mom and my stepfather fighting downstairs. And as it always did, it got physical. I could hear him beginning to beat my mom. And honestly, you know, I'd had enough. I was sick and tired of living that lifestyle. I was sick and tired of waking up every day filled with fear. I was sick and tired of coming home from school upset about my situation, living with intimidation. And I walked downstairs and as I turned the corner, I saw him beating my mum. My sister, who was only 11 years old at the time, was standing there with the phone in one hand, you know, threatening to call the police, and a kitchen knife in the other to protect herself. And as I looked at that situation, it, it was like life just hit pause for a second. And I thought, this is not what a family is supposed to be. This is not what a dad is supposed to be. And this is not what I want to be, in, be involved with. And so as I went across the room with all that I had, I threw this massive haymaker punch and connected to the side of his face. He fell to the ground, bounced back up instantly. Obviously, I couldn't throw a punch. And he grabbed me by the neck and slammed me through the wall. And I, I crumbled to the ground. And I got back up and I left home that night and I've never seen him since. I ran away, I went to my dad's house, who I didn't really have a relationship with at the time, and I just remember begging my dad to take me in. Through tears, through broken words, just pleading with him to accept me, to take me into his ha home because I didn't want to go back to where I was previously living. He took me in and, you know, for the first time in my life, I thought that things were going to begin to get good. I'm living with my dad now, it's what I've always wanted, a father figure that I can reference from. But the problem was, although my situation had changed, my home life, my friends, my school had changed, I hadn't changed. And the problem was deep within me. I only continued to get worse. I got involved uh, with the wrong crowd. I started drinking and doing drugs more regularly uh, to the point that it became a daily occurrence. Uh, I was failing every single subject at school, uh, started shoplifting, started breaking into cars and houses. My friends and I would wag school. Uh, we would go into the city. Uh, we would look for the old women uh, and we would snatch bags and snatch phones and you know, just feed off that adrenaline that it gave us. And what really tipped me over the edge was I committed a pretty serious crime and I got caught for it. And because I'd been caught committing crimes in the past, the police, they said to me that I'm looking at either juvie or jail. And you know, the truth is that scared me. That really began to make me question the path that I was traveling, the life that I was living. I went to school just a few days later and I walked into maths and I saw a friend of mine who I used to drink with, party with, uh, you know, shoplift with, I'd noticed some drastic changes in his life. I'd noticed that he'd stopped doing some of those things and I began to consider why. I went, I sat next to him there in maths and I said, Bobby, what's going on, man? You've changed, something's different about you. And without any hesitation, he looked at me and he said, I've given my life to Jesus and I don't wanna live that lifestyle anymore. He's done something on the inside and you can obviously see it on the outside and Sean, he can do it for you too. He invited me to a church event. I came and I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ like I've never heard it before. I heard that Jesus died for my sins and that he wants a relationship with me. There was no stained glass windows. There was no holy water. There was no rituals taking place. But what I saw was an opportunity for relationship with God. And I wanted it. So I responded, I gave my life to Jesus and I want to tell you the moment that I did it, I felt an embrace. Psalm 68 says that God is a father to the fatherless and he became that father that I always wanted. He became that dad that I never had growing up. And instantly I, I felt approval, I felt love, I felt acceptance. 
I felt hope. And as I continued coming to church, I very quickly discovered that not only did he want a relationship with me, but he wanted to help me with my life. He restored my relationship with my mom and my dad. He has blessed me with a wife, and now I'm learning how to be a father of my own daughter. You know, what God plucked me out of is incredible. As I look back at it, I'm so humbled and I'm so grateful. And really the only way to sum it up and the only way to describe it is undeserved. In my early childhood at primary school, I went through a phase where I was bullied because of my ethnicity. That was hard for a kid that only grew up with his dad. And I knew that I had Tongan blood in me, but because I was Indian and you could see it, I was ashamed of it. I wasn't ashamed of my dad. I wasn't ashamed of who I, who, well, who I was, well, at least I didn't think I was. But looking back, I, I know that, you know, I didn't want to be the skinny Indian kid that people were able to bully and push over. I didn't want to be the easy pushover kid that I was. But it just ended up happening that way. I ended up moving on to high school and I thought, great, brand new start. You know, I no longer have to see these guys that I went to primary school with. These, this bullying would stop. And being the man I was, I, I, I love sport. I followed a lot of sport and I just got involved in sport. I met some guys that really like to do the same things, play basketball, rugby, touch, soccer. And I just absorbed all of that in. I took it. To be the guy that was once bullied, to become so popular, it, it almost felt like fame. And I felt like I had everything I ever wanted right here in the school. But those very few mates that I hung out with, they ended up leaving the school. They got involved in some stuff that I had no idea about. Uh, they left and I started getting involved in the same things that they were involved with. I, at the age of 13, I got introduced to alcohol. First time I ever drank beer, first time I ever held a cigarette, and it was the first time I smoked marijuana. And for a guy that has been rejected his whole life, from birth up until the end of his primary school, I just wanted to be accepted. So I, I end up going into high school, I, I make the first 15 rugby team, and I am, I'm so excited. Here I am, I'm still skinny, but you know what, I'll put, a, I'll put a bit of meat on, I got a bit of muscles and you know, boys have respect. And people viewed me as, as this superstar in the school and I loved it, every moment of it. There wasn't a party that I didn't get invited to because I was in the first 15. I was always there at everything, no matter what was going down in our high school, I was there because I knew the right people and I was involved in the right things. The right things ended up being the wrong things. I ended up missing a couple of games because I was too drunk, too stoned to get on the rugby field. My biggest opportunity, I could have started playing in, in rep teams, I blew because I was too drunk. I ended up leaving high school and um, I start playing club rugby, I get involved in an apprenticeship and things are going well. You know, I'm like, okay, well, at least if I didn't make anything in professional rugby, I'm gonna get an apprenticeship, I'm gonna become a carpenter, what I've always wanted to be. I ended up leaving my apprenticeship for a couple of years, which just led into a very bad path of just drunkenness. And at the age of 20, something just shakes my whole world. I'm dating this girl and she ends up falling pregnant with my beautiful son. The year of 2012, my sister persuaded me to move to Australia. And it was the best decision that I made. I come and I get invited to this church. And um, it's 
nothing it's like nothing i've ever seen before it's to me i grew up in, going to a catholic school so it's to me it's like it's a church come on stained glass windows and things like that that's what i'm picturing she brings me to this church that she goes to and i'm thinking where's the church that's just the building and she goes no it's inside and i'm like okay let's go i sit down and there's people that just come up to me before and after and just you know talking to me it was that point in my life that I seen what a true Christian really is. And that defined my whole life from that day on. The next, the next uh, weekend on the Sunday, I gave my life to Christ and it was something that I, I, you cannot describe unless you really feel it yourself. Unless you actually receive Jesus Christ into your heart, you would never feel the feeling that I felt. And I, I went home that day thinking, you know what, things are going to change. And I just felt it that deep down, down inside that things are definitely going to change from here on. I ended up dating a, a godly woman. I could never ever imagine my life going down this path. Six months into being saved that we start dating. Um, three months after that, I proposed to her. Six months after that, we get married. and. I'm telling you, it was the most craziest thing that I probably could have ever done in my life, but it has brought the most joy in my life so far. I've never looked back on my life and said, you know what, I regret everything that happened because I truly believe that everything God did, He did for a reason. And that is why I'm standing here today. I grew up in a uh, fairly good family. Uh, Mom and dad were hard workers and uh, they did an excellent job, you know, um, raising us, uh, their seven children. They, they lived uh, during the war and uh, they've experienced the war. And raising, you know, after the war, raising a family wasn't that, uh, you know, easy. It was difficult, but Due to hard work and just persevering, you know, they, they really did an excellent job raising us, their children. Um, you know, we didn't have much growing up, but, you know, we never lacked anything. So I think that in a way that was, that was good. I, I had a f fairly uh, good childhood memories, uh, happy childhood. And uh, I remember, you know, mom and dad used to go to church and, you know, they used to bring us along and I was probably around seven uh, when I had a real consciousness about God and uh, church and um, after that you know during my teenage years growing up uh, as, a, as a teenager especially in high school um, it was a bit tougher um, you know I was sort of trying to find out a bit more of who I am a bit of my identity and uh, you know but you know, I suppose during those days, you know, we just had to, you know, study and go to school and, you know, try to, to, do, to do the best we, we can. And uh, one of the things that my parents always told us, and I think this really got stuck into my head, is, you know, if you want to better your life, you know, study and go to university. And uh, that's what I did. And um, after university, that is when things have changed a little bit. Uh, my hopes of, you know, getting a job wasn't happening and uh, there was lack of opportunity in the city where I was living in and uh, work for me was too far in between and there I had a lot of free time and I suppose it is during those free times that you know um, I started to just uh, you know get involved with uh, with drinking you know I was a bit depressed because I wasn't you know life wasn't happening for me then and a way of you know trying to pass the time was to drink with mates and go partying. My friends and I we were trying to buy some more alcohol, and there's a group there. And for some reason, I just punched this guy, and um, things really went wrong because it escalated. And one of these guys 
pulled out a 22 caliber and tried to shoot me front on. You know, it was about this much and he pulled the trigger. Luckily, he didn't fire. So I was so angry inside that I went home, got my gun and got my grenade because I wanted to revenge, you know. I wanted a bit of revenge. So I was looking for this guy and wanting to blow him up. You know, it was lucky I didn't find him because, you know, if I, I never know what would have happened if I did. And uh, even now, that if I remember that incident, that, you know, that question of, of what if, you know, what, what would have happened if I actually did kill someone. A more serious incident um, happened where my brother, my cousin, and my best friend were ambushed by a group. And as a consequence, my cousin was stabbed in the heart and killed instantly. And uh, the more I got violent and the more I wanted to, you know, um, fight back and, uh, you know, revenge the death of my cousin. You know, I had a girlfriend around this time who is now my wife. Uh, we were in a de facto relationship for about, you know, two years. And out of this relationship, we had a son. And, um, but you know, I was still a bit, you know, drinking. Uh, I was still being irresponsible, going out with mates um, and coming home, you know, early hours in the morning. And this would happen very, you know, often. Uh, there were times where, you know, uh, my wife would just cry and not talk to me and obviously I felt sorry for her um, there was one night where you know I slept in the cot with the baby and uh, you know obviously this was uh, you know you never know I might have squashed that baby if you know and because of that stupidity and selfishness uh, my wife was ready to leave me and the thought of uh, being left uh, by the most uh, important people in my life, you know, was unbearable. This is when I started to question life. Uh, there were too many unpleasant things happening, um, too many um, dark pits. And I realized that if things don't change, you know, I will never give a future to, to, to this young family. So this is probably when I started to search uh, for God and uh, a friend of mine who was a Christian introduced us to a church. And we went to the church for a while um, and uh, I was able to know the pastor and uh, he did encourage us to, you know, get married. And that's what I did. We just got married, it's very simple just in our lounge, you know, with a few uh, family and friends. But at least I know that, you know, I did the right thing by my, my wife now, you know. God also sent uh, another pastor uh, in my path who was starting a new church. And uh, at first I thought maybe, uh, you know, I can, you know, start going to his church and helping him out. And, uh, but, you know, I really didn't have any intentions of uh, committing myself. I just went there um, occasionally to start with until, you know, I became more, it became more frequent um, because I really liked the way he preached. And, uh, you know, there were things in the preaching that really touched me. There were things in the preaching that really dealt with some issues in my, in my life. There were times where I just hated the preaching. Sometimes I loved it because, you know, it was almost like a love and hate relationship because he was dealing with real issues in my life. You know, there were thorns in my life that were being pulled because of the preaching and, you know, I'm able to just respond because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It took me about six months uh, before I actually commit, uh, you know, uh, received Jesus Christ uh, as my Lord and Savior, because I wanted to, I wanted this, you know, to be to be genuine. I need, I wanted to know that, you know, Christianity was was genuine, 
and I just went along and just you know um, keep going to church and listening to the preaching until God really broke me down and uh, I really you know just went to the to the altar you know ask him to forgive me of my sins ask him to help me and uh, when I finished praying that sinner's prayer after a long time uh, of being in church you know there was almost this audible sound for, you know from above that says everything was gonna be all right and you know it's just that release of all you know the baggage the hurt the pain uh, that happened in my life became you know uh, you know there was that sort of uh, a sense of peace really and um, after that event, you know, I started to bring my family to church. And, well, you know, the, 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 the experience of, you know, God really was the main thing. Knowing Him and Him being real was, uh, was such an amazing thing. And, um, and uh, I give God all the glory for the things He's done in my life. And obviously, including my children, you know, who are now saved as well. So, yeah, praise God for everything, really. I've always known wrong from right For the dark run into Try to run and I try to hide. In the end, I guess I lost. My life began in a little outback town called Tenor Creek in the Northern Territory. I often think about my childhood and I'd say that it was uh, euphoric. My understanding of anything about religion or God came primarily from my mother, who was a Catholic herself and she raised us that way. I went to church regularly but being dead religion as I got older I had questions about it. I, I never really questioned the reality of God but I did question religion and so by the time I was 17 years of age I still believed in God but I didn't have any confidence in religion and like a lot of people raised in religion I I had all kinds of questions and doubts and I loved horses. I'd been involved in horses since I was, a, I was a young boy. And that love for horses and for the cattle station and the outback life took me to work on cattle stations. So by the time I was just over 17 years of age, I was working in a, on a large cattle property, had about 60,000 head of cattle. Working on this large cattle property, it was seven days a week, working with horses, working with cattle. And, um, and that's, that was the life for me. I, I was extremely immersed in that. But I have to concede that even during the years of that way of life, deep in my heart, there was always something that was still missing. There was a vacuum, there was an emptiness. And even at night, you'd sit around and look at the fire and tell stories and exaggerate telling those stories. And, and much as I much as I enjoyed what I was doing, there was there was still a yearning inside. There was an emptiness. There was a searching. Eventually, my love for horses took me back to, to near the city in Queensland. Um, my father had retired, and he bought a, a piece of property in the Brisbane Valley. Uh, we were involved in breeding horses, uh, training horses. And my love for those horses and my, my ability with that led me to, to making that my, my full-time interest. I was training horses, breaking them in, began to travel the shows. I was involved in breaking horses into both saddle and also for harness. And, but that, that life that took me back to the city, it also put me in touch with things that I'd never really had much to do with before. And particularly one of those things was drugs. Uh, I knew about drugs and I knew the warnings about drugs, but like many people, you ignore the warnings. And it began to open a door in my life that eventually was going to lead to some really bad destruction. During that time, I, I met a girl that I ended up uh, getting married to. Reached a point in that marriage where 
it was so bad that, that we both recognised we had to try and do something to, to salvage the marriage. And so I made a decision to go back to the Northern Territory, back to the outback where I was from, to go back to work in a cattle station and to break off all the ties that we had uh, to the city. I was already addicted very, very badly to drugs. So I packed up one day with the girl I was married to, I packed up two horses and, and drove a long drive from Queensland back up to the Northern Territory. It was about 3,000 kilometres. Landed in a little town in the Northern Territory called Catherine, began to work there. Uh, this, was in the, this was in the 80s. Um, I was making a lot of money, making about $1,000 a week cash in the hand at that particular time. But my addiction to drugs and my lifestyle just continued to be worse and worse and deteriorate. Drinking, doing drugs, and uh, I was wasting so much money on alcohol and drugs that I, I could hardly even make the payments on my car. The marriage got so bad. I made a decision one day to move from Catherine in the Northern Territory uh, up to the city of Darwin. Of course, drugs after a while become, a, it's, it's escapism and, and then eventually what happens if you're addicted to drugs is that becomes a reality. And so I would do drugs every day, all day, when I got up in the morning, when I went to bed at night. And so there was no enjoyment in drugs now. Now it's just an addiction and it's just how you live your life. And being straight is almost, it's not your reality, so drugs become your reality. And like any, any person would is this girl that I'd married, she, she loathed the lifestyle of drugs and, and the wildness. But I remember clearly, I remember very distinctly one particular night or a few particular nights that in the midst of these arguments and fights that she made this statement and said, look, I can't handle the drugs anymore. It's either going to be the drugs or it's going to be me. And with, uh, with a desperate heart sore state of mind, I remember saying to her, I'm choosing the drugs. And not because I wanted to, but because I couldn't quit. I tried to quit so many times and I just couldn't quit. One particular morning, I, I got up to go off to work. We fought as usual, even be the beginning of every day. And I'll never forget this particular morning, I'm heading off to work. I was working as a welder at the time. And I went to grab this particular saddle. I was gonna go and ride straight after work that day. And she protested heavily about taking that particular saddle. And my parting morning leaving for work that day was, was swinging this saddle around my head by the, by the stirrup iron. And, flinging it off into the air and just jumped in my, my truck and I, and, I, and I roared off to work. Not knowing that that day was a, was a landmark day. It was a landmark day because when I came home in the afternoon, she was gone. In fact, everything was gone. Uh, she'd taken a horse, she took the dog, she took all our belongings. She must have got help from somewhere, must have planned this. And basically she was gone, she was out of my life. I'm broke, I'm a drug addict, I'm by myself. And on a Sunday afternoon, I was sitting in a caravan in what we call in Australia a caravan park or a trailer park. It's the roughest place in the city and I'm just sitting by myself at the little table. And something said to me, it, was, it wasn't an audible voice, but there was just a voice that said to me, you need to go to that building that you've been driving by and that you've been noticing. And that's what I did. I got in my truck, I drove there. It was about a half an hour drive. I parked in the car park. I walked into the doors of that building, which it turned out that this building was a Christian church. I didn't even know then it was a Christian church. There were no crosses. Uh, there was nothing that told me that it was Christian. Remember, my own understanding of Christianity was religion, the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church. And I walked in and I sat at the back in a chair and I'll never forget there was a drum kit and there was some guitars and things. I'd always loved music. I sat at the back. And so I, this, this, what, what I now know is a church service. It begins, it's full of people. There's probably a hundred people perhaps there. 
it's like drums, guitar, rock and roll. They're singing. It's upbeat. It's 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 exciting. It's vibrant. It's happy. It's alive. And and I'm just sitting at the back there in my basically my cowboy clothes, a drug addict. And the service began, and the fellow was preaching. As it turns out, he was preaching a sermon, and he kept talking about the children of Israel and. I couldn't work out how this one guy could have so many children. I, I never got it. I never understood anything that he was preaching about. But what happened was he got to the end of the sermon and this was the part that I did understand. And he began to ask for people to, to bow their heads and close their eyes in respect. And he began to say, just in a, just in a very few moments, a few brief minutes, he began to speak about if, you, if your heart isn't right with God, and I tell you, those words are embedded upon my mind to this day about your heart's not right with God. And I tell you, those, those, those words just burned into my heart because, because I knew that was me. And I remember he said, if you're here and your heart isn't right with God, would you raise your hand? And you know, without any hesitation, I raised my hand because I, I knew I wasn't right with God. Uh, the preacher invited me to come up to the front. I did. He asked me to, to kneel down. They said, you know, somebody can pray with you. And I want to tell you that as I prayed those simple words, and I, and, and I can remember distinctly to this day that, that one of the things that I said to God was I said, God, I know that you're real. I'd never, I'd never, never, not, never stop believing. Every, everybody knows that God's real. And as I, as I began to pray and I said, God, I know that you're real. And if you will take away this drug addiction, I'll be a Christian. And I really didn't know what a Christian was, but I didn't know what I was getting myself in for. But I want to tell you that as I, as I prayed that prayer, I know that Jesus Christ forgave me and he came into my life and he has been the central figure of my life ever since. Have I made mistakes as a Christian? Hundreds of them. But that same forgiveness stands and he continues to forgive me because as long as I confess my sin, God's faithful and just to forgive me and it cleansed me from all unrighteousness. And I've had the most incredible life since Jesus Christ came into my heart to be my savior. The world is a system that has turned away from him. It is a mystery that God would give his son for people like us. But that's what makes the gospel so amazing. It says that all who believe in him, whether they are young or old, whether they are educated or uneducated, regardless of their ethnic group, regardless of their nationality, Regardless of their religious upbringing, he said, all who would believe would never perish. And that word perish speaks of a danger, a judgment that is one day to come, that is fixed by the power of the gospel. You see, salvation is a finished Salvation is the great need of all humanity. Throughout the gospel, the message keeps declaring as in the gospel of John 3, where the Lord Jesus says, you must be born again. The book of Acts declares that there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. To be saved means there was trouble. To be born again means we were born wrong. And so the gospel becomes the good news that everything that has been gone wrong in our life and in our society can be fixed. The word is to be redeemed by the power of the gospel.
of the money, the past goes big house, prestige, materialism, narcissism. All of the riches and all of the power got everyone on my social network and everyone like I'm a beach. Hey, externally we got it going on. Doing Ralph Lauren, Louis Vuitton, Versace, Doge, Gucci, Dior, Oscar de la Renta, Armani, and more. Get the way bands on. Hey, got the ray bands on. Everywhere I go, I gotta have it on. Wine and dine in the most expensive restaurants. Swag. Walking and talking, up effing and stepping, and name on the back. Popular man. But behind those ray bands, yeah. It's the real. All you. the lies. The game. You fake it to make it, and you play the role that steers you away. The price is so Take over, it's more than all the material things tonight yeah. ba -ba 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 Buying everything does not bring happiness tonight You can't buy love, you can't buy happiness, you can't buy love The soul is what really matters when everything is gone When you die, you can't even take anything with you So the question is, where you gonna spend eternity? Where's the other life? I can tell you right now, I can tell you right now 